when I was sharing last week about truth, uh, I passed a comment about wisdom that several folks uh, emailed me about, and uh, one of which, Ralph, if you're watching, you may be watching right now in Switzerland, you helped spur this on, sir, so here we are. We're going to talk a bit about God's wisdom today. So let's have a word of prayer as we get into this. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is truly the teacher. And Spirit of God, I thank you that we have, down deep, eyes to see, ears to hear, mind to perceive, and a heart that's open. So God, I thank you now for leading us in this direction regarding wisdom. Now, first of all, uh, if you're actually watching the playback of this, I would highly recommend that you see the previous message to this one called Truth of Consequences. It's on the app or on our YouTube site. If not, I'm going to try to review just a hair of last week and move on into this week. But there were certain concepts and statements that were made about dualism, tree knowledge of good and evil, and the paradox of the tree of life and its oneness uh, that is important uh, because I can't rehearse all of that today, but just going to have to move forward. One of the key aspects was to look at the contrasting worlds of Christ and the serpent, or the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or yet another way to say it again was the paradox of oneness in comparison to dualism. Another way to yet say it further would be living in the oneness paradox of the spiritual world or the dualistic world of religion and self. How's that? That's highlighting uh, what we talked about yesterday, pretty much. We said in our last lesson that truth is not the preponderance of the evidence or the proper assortment of facts. Rather, truth is a spiritual state from which we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28. It has nothing to do with facts, right or wrong, in any form. That's the hard part to get when you add, the, uh, add to that in any form. Because we want to perceive still facts, and that if I somehow have this truth and then I have facts, I'm really on the, on the right side of things. But actually, it doesn't work that way. It has to do with the eyes through which we see. That's our key aspect here. What I'd like to do first off, as we look at wisdom, God's ocean of mirrors, I want to just quickly rehearse, I'm not going to play the, a video, but I just want to rehearse to you what we saw when we played, if you remember, television excerpt from the game show to tell the truth. And those three are the actual tell, tell the truth beginnings from the 50s all the way to nowadays in 2020. Uh, so it's kind of evolved, and there's actually a couple of others in between. But what we saw, if you remember, what we, what we had was uh, to tell the truth is about a, a series of guests they come in threes, and they all claim to be the same person. Then you have a panel of about four people um, who are to extract information from each of those guests to decide who is actually telling the quote-unquote truth. And in the particular segment that we saw, it was all about a man that composed a song for Elvis Presley. And who was that man? And the four panelists were extracting the facts, and what we found was is that at the end, all of the, all, three of the four picked the guest number two, and one picked guest number one, and they gave their reasons. Well, he had this fact right, he had that fact right, he had this fact right. And then all of a sudden, there comes the famous statement, well, the real so-and-so, please stand up. And, you know, a couple of guys you know, do that little motion first, like, okay, who is it really, you know? And then finally, it was actually guest number three that stood up which means they all got it wrong. And, and by the way, I didn't plan it that way. I just picked that episode. I didn't know at the original time when I first picked it, that's how it was going to end. But it went perfect with the message. Because here's the point. When the real guy stood up, all the facts and what they chose fell away. It was no longer relative. 
once the unveiling of, quote, the truth occurs, the facts become irrelevant. That doesn't mean sometimes through some facts we may not, quote, get it right. But the challenge is getting it right can be still furthest from the truth. Why? Because we are born into what for the time being we will call a fallen dualistic world as fallen egoistic people, and it's very difficult to see anything other than that. However, that is only because we've never used our real eyes. It reminds me of a famous segment from the first movie in The Matrix. In this segment, Thomas Anderson, known as The One, and potential savior, now renamed Neo, which is from the Greek word neos, which means new, and also neo is an uh, anagram of the word one. They're quite clever here. And until this point, he's been living in the physical, if you will, make-believe world of illusion called the Matrix, which is supposed to be a type of our world. The reality is we are living in an illusion, because how we see it gets interpreted in certain ways that we actually never really see totally what's out there. For example, I like to play this game for a minute. Whenever you go outside at night and you look up at the beautiful stars and you say, isn't that wonderful? Do you realize that you're only seeing the past? We'll never see the future really in the stars in a very physical sense because Millions and billions of miles away, those stars, some of which may not even exist anymore, they've already burnt out, but because light is traveling at 186,000 miles per second, and these are billion miles away, in some cases, we're looking at stars that died millennia ago. So we really don't see things necessarily the way they are, even with that example. Well. Neo, or Mr. Anderson, has been living in this matrix, this world, and then finally there comes a point through a series of events where, for lack of a better word, he is born into the real world. He awakens from the illusion in the movie. Uh, you, you see him uh, kind of get out of this pod-like thing where he's been attached to this il illusion world by the, the machines, which are kind of like the devil, for lack of a better word, of the evil ones in, in, the, in, the, in the film. But when he comes to, things change. As a matter of fact, he kind of is burst out through uh, a canal type of thing, which is like a birthing, and then into a sea of water where then Morpheus and Trinity, that are two of our heroes in the movie, have this uh, ship that reaches down into that water and brings him up. And where we're picking up this scene right now is when Neo awakes for the first time in the real world. Let's have a look. It's a lot of work. What are you doing? Your muscles have atrophied. We're rebuilding them. Why am I, sir? You've never used them before. Rest, Neil. The answers are coming. There were three very powerful New Testament like statements. Neil asks, Am I dead? 
Morpheus, which by the way is Greek morpho, which comes, which means to take form. We are familiar with an English word metamorphosis, which is actually a Greek word which means transformation or change. Okay, Morpheus says, far from it. Why ask that question? Because for truth, or we're going to find wisdom to truly come forth from within us, there is an aspect of ourselves that we will be asking, am I dead? Because that ego is going to have to die and you'd be surprised how alive it is. The second question he asks is, what are you doing? And Morpheus says, your muscles have atrophied, we are rebuilding them. You see, here's the point. In this world, we don't use our spiritual muscles. In that world, we do. The challenge before us is to actually use them in that world as opposed to think we're using them because we have some information biblically or religiously or something here. God, in effect, is rebuilding, to use their term, our spiritual life, our spiritual muscles. And then finally is that last statement, why do my eyes hurt? Morpheus, you never used them before. And that really, I think, is exactly what we're talking about. Jesus came to really awaken our true eyes and stop using the false eyes. Last week we talked about how the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about good, evil, right, wrong, holy, sin, God, devil, good guys, bad guys, enemies, heroes, etc. It's always this, this contrast. And even though we think we can have a world of good without... Uh, having evil, the reality is good has to have evil. If not, it has no identity. In the tree of life world, it's a whole different point of view. As we pointed out too, Jesus was very clear. My father causes his son to rise on the just and the unjust. My father causes it to rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. He was using these terms, and throughout the Bible, he will use at times the dualistic terms because that's what we understand, but actually he's describing how my father doesn't see righteous and unrighteous. He doesn't see holy sin. He doesn't see... Uh, uh, just and unjust, my father blesses because that's who he is. We, in the dualistic world, reduce everything down to a behavior and a code, which is the whole point, really, of the Old Testament, is revealing that the code doesn't work. And in the end of the code and its priesthood, it's death. It murders the lamb. With that in mind, as we were talking about truth last week, let's move into now this word wisdom. Because the other side of truth is wisdom. Spiritual truth and wisdom are two sides of the same coin. Neither can, listen, neither can be attained or ascertained without authentic meekness and humility, which means we need to be very self-aware or egoistically aware. We need uh, to d desire to know the difference between the knowledge of good and evil, the ego, the way of the serpent, or the tree of life, divine love, the way of the Christ. We have to become aware of the one so we can lay it down. See, up until this point, our ego's been our identity. How dare you do that to me? Don't you know that? How dare he cut me off as if you own the freeway? You know, how? where do you think that comes from? We previously discussed why the apostle cho apostles chose the word for truth, aletheia, which means not concealed in contrast to the other Greek word, which means indisputable fact. Matter of fact, it was only used once in the entire New Testament, which is in Acts, uh, I believe it was, I don't have it in my notes here, something like 1936. Why? Because this is not about what's an indisputable fact. This is about an unveiling of something far more amazing. It's the unveiling 
of the inner state. And when that is unveiled, the reality of Christ within. Right? Remember Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what this is about, being unveiled. Our challenge is that because we start in a dualistic or serpentine tree of knowledge of good and evil place, especially in the Western world, we are more interested in being saved from something and therefore on the right quote-unquote spiritual team, as if there's a competition in the mind, you know, of religion, right? It's always against evil. And, and always, religion will find an enemy. And if it doesn't have one, it will create one. Watching that happen unfold, even in the midst of the coronavirus, the enemies that are being created is amazing right now. Which really implies, I've never left that world. You know, understand something, just because the presence, the anointing, whatever you want to call it, is on somebody, doesn't mean their inner place is where it's revealing the Christ. I mean, Jesus was clear. You call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. He goes on to say that you prophesy in my name, you heal in my name, but I don't know you. If you think about it, to this day, religion needs an enemy and will fight one regardless of the fact that Jesus was victorious and rose from the dead. Let's review something we touched on last lesson. We know that based on John 1.14 that Jesus is a revelation of grace and truth, whatever that actually means at the moment. And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now notice what it says in Proverbs 8. Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? On the top of the heights beside the way, where the paths meet, she takes her hand beside the gates at the opening of the city. Let's look at the entrance of the doors. She cries out to you, O men, I call, and my voice to the sons of men. Before we go to James 3, I just want to highlight the wisdom is at the door and Jesus is the door. And like I said last week, to make the point, many of us go up to the door, but never use the wisdom of God to enter in. Matter of fact, we're more excited that we found the door and telling other people, I found the door, I found the door. You need to receive the door just like I received the door. The door is fantastic. Look at that. Look at the, look how the color it is. Look what it looks on that. It's just amazing. It's just fantastic. And God is trying to say, would you come in, please? From a Hebraic perspective, truth, if you remember from last week, is the beginning, middle, and end of the living Torah. It's the first, middle, and last letter of the entire Hebrew alphabet. And it was there, I think, is when I came up and started to talk briefly about wisdom. Yeah, because I actually said, a kindred word in Hebrew thinking is chokhmah, which is the word we translate wisdom, which has little to nothing to do with the intellect or a Western form of using knowledge. Rather, it's a stream of consciousness. If truth, by a Hebraic and Christ-centered definition, is Quote, when we are in a state of reflection flowing from the compassion that was revealed at the cross, what is the wisdom that flows from God that causes us to enter the door? And if you remember, we even referred to the parable of the prodigal son, where we had the one son that wasted his life, his inheritance actually, on wasteful living, but he managed to come home and he entered into this celebration with Nothing more than a compassionate father who didn't even bring up his wrongs. But then there was the older brother who knew exactly where the door is, knew exactly where the house is, and heard all this clamorous uh, celebration going on and yet never entered in. But he served his father in the field and he kept his commandments. And again, I suggest to you, many of us, even in evangelical fundamentalism, may have never entered the door. Some of us are excited by the music. We love the music. It's fantastic. But we may not have entered in totally. 
In James 3.17, think of, think of this. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Hmm. Think of its attributes before we define it. It's what? Peace-loving. So it's not warring. It's considerate, submissive, full of mercy. And excellent fruit. The word good there is excellent fruit. Impartial and sincere. If we were to do an internal spiritual examination right now, how many walls, biases, justifications, conditional mercies, qualified impartialities, and calculated sincerities are there? In the end game, is it really about the wisdom gain or what we need to let go of to unveil the wisdom? The point is you cannot have the wisdom of the one and not let go of the other. What does all this mean? The Western view, the world we live in right now, particularly in the West, looks at three very specific, powerful biblical words even, from a point of view that actually may not be very biblical. The first is knowledge. Knowledge is the acquired facts. I got my facts, I now have knowledge. Two, understanding, which is the arranging of knowledge or those facts. When I have proper understanding, I've taken those facts, I've arranged them, now I understand. And then finally, we have wisdom. The ability to use what we understand and know. That's wisdom. Tack on to that. Mature people are supposed to have more wisdom. Why? Because they have more understanding and knowledge. The challenge is, biblically speaking, uh, that's not how those words work. In the Eastern Hebraic biblical view, those words are not even in that order. The first aspect we'll need to embrace is wisdom is actually the greatest, and that's first in line. It's called chokmah in Hebrew. The second is bina, understanding. And then finally, the third is da'at, knowledge. In Proverbs 4, 7 through 8, it says, Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it cost you all you have, guess we're right back, back to the cost here. It'll cost you all you have, get understanding. Esteem her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. Notice it comes right back to the feminine aspect of it. Now, without getting too gender-based in the sayings of boys and girls, the idea of the feminine being that which is responding to some form of stimulus. Wisdom is going to respond to your inner state. That's really the key. What will Chokhmah and Bina cost us? Every drop of our ego every drop of the serpent nature within us, every drop of the knowledge of good and evil. Without the surrender of such, truth is veiled and Jesus is reduced to a glorified animal sacrifice. If you don't know what I mean by there, get the book Melchizedek. I talk about what that means. Because for most of us, Jesus is nothing more than a glorified animal sacrifice. We, we go sin, we go ask for forgiveness, we come back, we go do something else, we sin, we go back. No. But the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure within us. According to the Apostle Paul, it's desiring to be unveiled, created by the Father, and far more valuable than any paganistic sacrifice to withstand the wrath of some senior deity's judgment. So if you're ready, pray with me right now. And let's ask the Father to open to us what all this means. After all, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.24, Christ is the power of God 
and the wisdom of God. That's the power of Christ. We say power, we think of miracles. That's fine. But actually, that is rooted in this thing called the wisdom of God. Proverbs. Notice what it says. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters, but the fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. I love that analogy. Why? Because chokmah, described by many rabbis, is just that, the flowing water. Never stops, never ceases. Because chokmah is a constant flow of eternal consciousness of the limitless God. It never stops. It's not a, an ability to use any facts or knowledge. Rather, it's the eternal flow where all is. It's as James says, it comes from heaven and is first of all pure. It is the source of all. It is Christ. Thus, it is the revelation of the Father, the source of all that was, is, and shall be. It's the everlasting stream of life. In the real realm of true life, wisdom or the Christ Jesus, there is only one, the perichoresis, the dance, the unified dance of the Trinity with us in that dance as well. Actually, we would, if you want to say, we are the dance that the Trinity dances. To attain this purity, it has nothing to do with some form of moral correctness or legalistic rightnesses, gathering of facts or studying of Bible verses but an awe-filled humility of who God is and who we are together in him. Christ, God's wisdom, is the constant flowing of infinite awareness and is always dynamic. But what of Bina? What we call understanding. If wisdom, chokhmah, is this constant flow, and I'll give you some other examples of the wisdom in a minute, but what is then bina? Bina is this. If wisdom is the constant flow, bina is when I reach in and take a segment of it. It's an aspect of the entire flow. We want to put it in the context of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But if we do that, we leave the actual paradox of what the tree of life can be. This is not that kind of division. This is, if you will, a segment of the flow. This is like as if we had a movie film. Remember those eight millimeter movie films where each was a frame? But as it's moving, you have life and you see the cars driving and people. But the second you stop that and you look at just one frame, you don't get to see all of that. You just get to see one aspect of it kind of frozen in time. That's Bina. That's what understanding is. We now have a segment of the eternal flow. That's great. But what happens next is probably most important. And that's this. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. What does all that mean? Well, see, now he's drinking from the river. Now he has what in the Hebrew word is da'at, knowledge. So the chokhmah is flowing and flowing and flowing. And I reach in and I grab bina, a segment of the flow. And now from that segment of the flow, I'm drinking it. Now I know that segment of the flow. But why is the reverence of the Lord beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One understanding? What does that mean? Well, because wisdom is still the principal thing. Wisdom is still supreme, as it says in the NIV. Because the second I know, this is what winds up happening if I stay there. I get stuck. I get stuck, I'm no longer in the flow, I'm just in the know. And sadly, that's what happens to many of us when we look at the Bible 
or, quote, spirituality from a religious sense, we get stuck in what we know. That, especially in this past week, that's 666. This is the Antichrist. That's the devil. This is the judgment of God. You're stuck in what you know. I'll tell you why I say that in just a minute. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is death personified. What happens when water ceases to move? It stagnates. It's dead. It's dead. Thus the Dead Sea. Why is it called the Dead Sea? Because it's not moving. And when water is not moving, it eventually, if it had anything in it, will kill it too. This is why our rabbis use chokhmah, bina, and da'at in the way they, they do here. Because of what these Hebrew words really mean. If you notice, it has nothing to do with acquiring facts, arranging them, and then having the ability to use them. If anything, it's the opposite. We can enjoy momentary knowledge, but then we have to go back to the infinite flow, not letting any self-centeredness rule us and be encompassed by all that the Messiah is. We don't want to let my self-centeredness encompass the Messiah. Because when I do that, he's concealed. I'm not walking in truth now. Rather, what to flow constantly in the dynamic of God. Let me share with this, this another way. Let's try this. Let's look at this one. Wisdom is a blank piece of parchment or piece of paper. So consider, we're going to go chokhmah, bina, da'at. Wisdom is this blank piece of paper. Now think of what the Apostle Paul writes here in Ephesians 3.10. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the spiritual or heavenly realms. What is he saying? What is this idea, this manifold wisdom of God, multifaceted wisdom of God, which is why I use the word mirrors later on, which we'll come to. What does this all mean to us? What's the manifold wisdom of God? It's not the manifold knowledge of facts. Why are you harping on that so much? Because I'm trying to address, provoke, maybe even make you thirsty for another place. Before we continue to the next slide, I want to remind you once again which has become, if I can use the word, which has been, it's a new age word, a mantra. I was an interesting thing this week. Pastor Karen was corresponding with somebody today, and because she used a verse out of the, the message translation by, um, what's his name, Peterson. I can't think of his first name. We just went blank on his name right now. Eugene Peterson, there it is. The person came back saying, but this phrase is used by witches, so... The Message Bible is very suspect to me that it's some kind of New Age witchcraft thing. And here's the challenge. This is what I mean by knowing facts. I would like to believe that the wisdom of God is the source of everything. So even if we got to do the dualistic thing of which is bad, Christian's good, they didn't think of anything on their own. It all still comes from the same source, irrespective of how they use it. But see, what our religion has done is identify New Age movement, witchcraft. It's done all those things, and as a result, I have to be against that. Because if I am, and this is how I think, then I'm okay with God, and I live in quote-unquote the truth. That's the fact. No. No. No, 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 no. And, and it was sad because what that says of that person is her faith is built on fear. Which is really an impossibility. You, 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 you can't build faith on fear because fear and faith are technically the same thing, just being used in the opposite directions in a dualistic way of thinking. 
Okay, so consider that. Consider how many of us that are opposed to certain things, that fear certain things, are really built our religious system around, as I said last week, beliefs that calm me. But the second some information comes across my my, my path that seems to look like something I'm supposed to be against or fear or is quote-unquote wrong, all of a sudden, if that's being presented as a possible truth, then all of a sudden what happens? Cognitive dissonance. And I have to forcibly prove my place because if I don't, it kicks the scaffolding out from my foundation. Because my foundation isn't built on the Christ. It's built on what I believe about Bible verses and what's wrong and what's right, what's New Age, what isn't New Age, what's Buddhist, what's not Buddhist, what's Mormon and not Mormon, all those kind of things. So let's do our mantra one more time. We need to be a Christ-centered people with the Bible as a tool not a Bible-centered people hoping and assuming Christ will be a result. It'll never happen. While Paul was borrowing this phrase, the manifold wisdom of God, from Stoic Greek philosophy as well as some mythology, the context of his use is still very Hebraic in its thinking. So let's, let's go on to the next frame here because really I'm just going to remove our words and what we see is a blank piece of paper. This is the flowing stream. This is chokhmah. This is wisdom. Why do we say that? Because it is, in effect, the manifold wisdom of God. Chokhmah is the infinite possibilities of what could be understood. The blank piece of paper is the infinite possibility of all the words and letters and sentences that could be there. But watch what happens when I add a sentence. Vayasif af Adonai laharat ba Yisrael. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now, if you notice, all the possibilities have faded into the background. And I now have a segment, an understanding of something here, the, the bina that's come forth. The problem is, what if I get stuck there? Now, bina, again, means between or to distinguish. For example, in Genesis 1-4, uh, uh, it says, and God divided between the light and between the darkness. The word between there is bayin, same word, bina. Okay, dividing between light and dark. So from all the infinite wisdom, something has now taken form. As we see this segment, we experience now da'at. I know the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, which means that God gets angry. And what it also means is God will, even against his chosen people, if they if they do something wrong. But actually, if you notice, it even says, and he, the anger of the Lord, right, moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. The very thing that God told him not to do, now supposedly God's provoking him to do so he can be angry and execute judgment. When you say that, that's, it should be some measure of cognitive dissonance there because why would God tempt me to do something against his will so he can judge me. That doesn't make sense. So now cognitive dissonance moves in, and we read it this way. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and because David, not and he moved, and because David went and numbered Israel and disobeyed God. You now, if we could do that kind of stuff, we might as well go to, quote, the truth, end quote, Meaning, what is the wisdom of God here? What is really happening here? What is, and I'm not even going to get into the Hebrew words for a minute and well, all some of those things that they mean. Yesaf af Yahweh laharot ba Yisrael. What if 
I went back into the wisdom flow. And I didn't get stuck in what I know. By the way, what I know always makes me feel good. Going into the flow, back to the blank page, is very unsettling. But actually, that's the, quote, truest place you can ever be, unquote. So watch. First Chronicles 21, 1, the Satan el Yisrael. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Hmm. Maybe now I have a definition, a clarity of what the anger of the Lord is. God doesn't get angry. How about whatever you think this character is, Satan, is what gets angry. If I'd gotten stuck on what I knew, I would have never gained any chokhmah regarding God. These verses are, uh, are rather obvious to us, hopefully, although we may have read them in some other way. But when we think about it and we talk about the nature of God, you would think God has an anger management problem and anything can set him off like the Hulk. God mad, God crush, you know. No, but you see, we're seeing different sides of how things are viewed. Now, I'm not going to get into teaching on the anger of the Lord, the Af Yahweh or Af Adonai uh, today, but I'm trying to show you, even on the blank page, that the second I get some understanding of one aspect and I get that knowledge, many times we get stuck there. And even as I pointed out how we start to read it differently, it said that this anger of the Lord thing moved David to number Israel. Now, if you would say that was Satan, that may make a bit more sense because we see Satan as a tempter. Okay, but when I look at it the other way, that just God got angry and God moved David to do something contrary to what God first asked him to so he can now judge him, our brain goes, no, we can't do that. So then we read into it. Oh, God gets angry because David disobeyed him. And we skip over that part here and he moved him. Now you may say, DJ, you're speaking in convoluted riddles today. I'll take that as a compliment because they accuse Jesus of that. But more so because wisdom and truth require us to walk the path that leads to the door and enter in. This doesn't happen by reading our Bibles and listening to a preacher that excites us, even though I wish you thought of me that way, right? He's so exciting. I love his ministry. Okay. <laughs> See, the little laughter there sometimes is good before you, you know, you cut. It's the Novocaine before you pull the tooth. Okay. This doesn't happen by reading our Bibles and listening to a, a preacher that excites us, especially if they feed some religious aspect of our egos. No, it comes through laying down the serpentine self. As Jesus would say, take up your cross and follow me. He didn't just say, follow me and you'll get it. If that was the case, Peter, who had a revelation, we talked about that last week, and then denied him. And Judas, who followed him, would have never betrayed him. But let's try this again from a dualistic way. Maybe this will help and maybe these terms will press your thinking a little bit. You may say, but I'm an apostle. Look at the churches I've built and the people who listen to my message. Well, the gift of God works. Look at the mosques that have been built and the imams that people follow. How about the Buddhist temples and the people who worship there? So you could say you're just as successful. <laughs> of course, the next statement would be, yeah, but they're deceived. Yeah, they are wrong in what they worship. We know what's right and holy. Really? really? <laughs> Do we? Are we sure? I guess that's the problem. We are. We're so sure. <laughs> We're so sure. With that mind, there's another aspect of this infinite wisdom. It's like an ocean of mirrors. 
We've most likely seen the movies with the mirror fight scene. Now here are going to be two segments from two famous movies. The first one is 1974, starring Roger Moore as James Bond. What would a church service be if you don't bring up James Bond at least once? Christopher Lee as the villain Scaramanga and uh, Herve Villachese, if I said his name right, his sidekick as Nick, Nick, Nick Knack. Uh, from, this is from the second uh, Roger Moore movie. The first one was Live and Let Die. This is Man with the Golden Gun, where they uh, have a, this segment with these House of Mirrors thing. And then in 1973, it goes right into this other one from 1973, which is another one of those great movies of its time. Uh, and of course, I don't play the whole uh, fight scene here, so by the time you watch this, if you're at all interested, we're all going to run home and watch this movie. It's called Enter the Dragon, starring Bruce Lee uh, as Lee, and the villain, Kain Shi, which is, uh, he plays a part of a guy named Han, who is the, the villain here. In both of these movies, <laughs> released literally, literally less than a year from each other, both had their fight scenes in a room of mirrors. I'll come back to that. Let's watch. <laughs> you only have three bullets left. <laughs> I warn you. It's not over yet. Who really wins? How does he win? So we all have to go home and watch Enter the Dragon now, you know. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. Ezekiel tells us this. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river Chabar, 
that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. The Hebrew looks like this, and I'm going to highlight three particular areas there. Okay, first of all, it's this notion of being captive. The Hagolah. Hagolah means really not so much captive as, as exiled. When you think of captive, many, many times you just think of somebody in prison. But it's not just that they were in prison. It's they've been exiled away from their original home. He's letting us know that he was where we all are as we live in this physical world. By the serpentine tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It then says, Nahar Kebar, the river Chebar, we would say in more English. Well, the, the thing is, is this word river is describing, or the stream, if we go back to, in our minds to the picture of the flowing stream earlier, it's the sparkliness that takes place as the river flows. And the word kavar literally means like braiding the hair, intertwined. So that's kind of giving us the picture of what this looks like. So he's exiled from his original place, all of us, in a sense, through what we would commonly call the fall, have been exiled to the world of egoistic right and wrong thinking. In contrast to really where the Christ lives, as Jesus said, I'm from above, you're from beneath. He's from a different place. And then it says, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. I saw visions of God. Now, the Hebrew phrase there is marut Elohim, or actually va'are uh, marut Elohim. That's the last three words there at the bottom. And it really doesn't use the word vision, which is hazun. We get the word hazeh, which is the place or here from that. It's that idea of the hazun, the vision, having seeing something or getting a revelation. But that's not the word that's used here. Again, let me say the Hebrew word and maybe you'll hear an English word that's a bit similar. Okay, so first word is va'are, and I saw. And then here it is, marut, mirror. Marut. Elohim. It's now the multifaceted sparkling. See, he's looking at this flow of river and he's seeing all these different things, different sparkles, and he, and he goes in, if you will, uh, to that spiritual place within and he realizes he's seeing visions, if you will, or aspects of the infinite God. Psalms 36.6 says, your decisions are full of wisdom as the oceans are water. That's why I call this wisdom God's ocean of mirrors. Because what are these mirrors? Now, in the, the movies, of course, we see all the reflections and we can't really figure out which is the, the true guy. But that's the point. When it comes to God, there is so much you can't plug into any one specific thing and stay there. If you do, if we do, then all of a sudden we just go right back to this dualistic fallen world. But we're given this wonderful choice to let go of that and become who we are. Don't be exiled anymore, but come back home to that inner place where we truly, truly live. So to conclude this, in a dualistic world, a world where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has precedent, there will always be right and wrong, perceived truth and lies. But in the paradox of the tree of life, in the reality of the Trinity, in the reality of Christ, there is truth and wisdom, which has little to do with the Bible we know. But everything to do with our inner unveiling. Taking up one's cross and following Christ is shedding that egoistic shell and allowing our true identity, 
our true nature, reflected in the mirrors of God to come forth. It's leaving the world of exile and jumping into the flowing stream, the deep ocean, the fullness, a limitless parchment, allowing the understanding of God and ourselves to arise and take form and then reshape and go back again and reshape and take form and reshape. That sounds way too crazy. That, now that sounds new agey. Well, maybe Jesus was a bit more new agey than we think. Now he's into this other stuff. Well, get a load of this when it comes to forms. What does it say at the end of the, uh, end of the uh, was it the Gospel of Luke, on the, way, uh, on the road to Emmaus? It says, and he appeared to them in another form. Now, was he in physically another form, or were their eyes perceiving something other than what they, he really was? They walk and they talk, and he's, he's talking with them, sharing Bible verses, etc. And it wasn't until they got to Caiaphas' house and they went in. Notice about going into. Caiaphas, by the way, means father's house, or like the father. So they go into the father's house, they sit and have a meal, and the second they realize when he breaks bread who he is, he vanishes. Goes right back into, quote, the infinite wisdom. Why? Because they entered now. They became aware. All the Bible verses earlier didn't help them. All that aspect, they were, matter of fact, if you go back and read the text, they were like, yeah, it was, it's really exciting. But they could have just stayed there. Matter of fact, Jesus intentionally says to them he's going to continue to go further. And he made them, in effect, uh, beckon him to come in. No, no, it's okay. I'll keep going. I don't have to stay. Oh, no, please, please, please. Something's happening. Please, please, please. You see, the Bible is not bad. I'm not saying I'm putting it down. The Bible can, can inspire us. It can, it can draw us. But understand something. And we've heard it said before. I'm sure you've heard it. Read the Bible and it'll give you wisdom. I'm going to suggest this. You need to have wisdom to read the Bible. Open your Bible. There's where the truth lies. How about open your heart with truth and you'll find what the Bible actually says. You see, the other doesn't require any spiritual use of those muscles to go back to the matrix. It doesn't require us to really use our eyes for the first time. We just keep taking what was. Maybe we did get a glimpse of Jesus. How many times, if you've gone through Genesis Factor, you know I've said, how many times we've got a glimpse of the tree of life, and then we take that glimpse and we try to live, live it out through the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Father, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you that you are the source of all and that you do bless both the just and the unjust because in this world I've truly been both. That you cause your son, your blessings of all kinds to shine on the righteous and on the unrighteous because in this world I've been both. A father, I pray that is, maybe we're going to have to go back and re-listen to this several times in order to grasp for a moment what Amet, Alethea, Chokhmah, Bina, and Da'at, what these ideas, what these realities are really. That like Jesus, we can present a compassionate father who is not even interested in the rights and wrongs like the older brother, but is only interested that his son is home. And his son can now be his son again. Father, may we all desire to go home today within ourselves. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Karen of Oasis of the Valley, and I'm here with Pastor Christine and Dr. John, and we'd like to share something with you. If you don't live in the local area and you'd like to be part of our Oasis Fellowship, we've got a way to connect. We'd like to get to know you personally by video conference calls and telephone calls. And Dr. John will tell you more about how that came about. It was just a few weeks ago, in literally one week's time, I got several emails from people in different parts of the United States and even overseas who were interested in finding a church in their area that's preaching the same powerful message that we are and in the way we are that's quite unique. And unfortunately, I couldn't give them really an answer. I know of a couple of churches and friends that are, are ministering like this, but honestly, there's not too many. And we are truly trying to press forward into a whole new arena in God right now. And uh, what wound up happening was that the thought occurred to me, well, we've got all this amazing technology. Why can't we pastor them with the video conferencing and stuff that you yeah. were talking about and minister into their life? And who knows what God will be able to do through that with enough people who maybe be able to start a church out there. Sounds good. So if you're interested, please click the link below and we'll explain more. 